if you have your book. We're starting on page 170. All right. What we're examining is the righteousness of God and how the righteousness of God uh, applies or is imputed uh, in salvation through the gospel. All right, in this part, in the number four point, the question is, how is the righteousness of God received? Now, we've agreed that the righteousness of God is necessary for salvation. So how is... I'm going to get cursive on accident. <laughs> the righteousness of God received. Now, this is not a esoteric philosophical or theological point. It's critical to our understanding of the gospel because it's here that we will be able to be first begin um, identifying where the modern false gospel uh, fails. All right, And that makes it a critical point. So it's uh, going to take all of your attention. This sounds, when we read through it quickly, it sounds simple. And that's one of the reasons that I wanted to do this commentary is to show you where heterodox uh, gospels split off, where they make mistakes. Okay? So we've agreed that the righteousness of God must be received in order for there to be salvation. Okay? But how is this righteousness of God received? The righteousness of God is given by faith. It must be received by faith. So we must identify what faith is. Okay, so that's our, our, our question. Our answer, of course, is it must be uh, given by faith. And received by faith. And so, naturally, our next question should be, what is this faith? that receives the righteousness of God. Two questions come to mind. Because the saying that the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel, it illuminates part of the problem, but it doesn't uh, but it assumes some facts that we ought to uh, impute into the question. Okay? A it assumes, when we say that the righteousness of God is revealed through the gospel, that assumes that this righteousness is offered, as we have already explained, um, or that it is offered, as we've already explained. In other words, to say that it's revealed, but just that it's revealed, doesn't solve anything. Imputed, or, or excuse me, um, intrinsic in that statement is that it's being revealed because it's being offered. That there is an offer of this righteousness in the question. For what comfort is it that Christ is revealed as willing and able to save if there is no offer of Christ to those who see their need? Right? The offer of Christ is implied directly by the revelation of Him to the soul. Okay. Now. We can say that the offer of Christ is also made patently elsewhere in the scriptures. But here, when we, uh, we, we need to examine that when the righteousness of God is revealed, and this, off, this offer is implicit in that righteousness being revealed. For it has no other purpose if it isn't used of God to draw man. If it isn't used as an offer to man of what of a uh, remedy for their condition. Alright? This offer of Christ is implied directly by the revelation of Him to the soul. Now this means that when Christ, the righteousness of Christ is revealed in the, regen or, excuse me, in the regenerate or in the elect, the soul identifies the offer in the righteousness. See? 
if I have no need or have believe I have no need of Christ and the righteousness of Christ is revealed, I will not see any offer in that because it has no um, affinity for me. Does everybody understand that? But if I have been given the ability to see Christ aright and to see my need, when it is revealed, there is also revealed the offer of that. It's like if you were in a desert and parched and thirsty, and someone displayed before you pure, clear water, you would need to recognize your need, and if you recognized your need, that would be the solution to your problem. Would be made would be revealed to your soul. Right? So the revelation of the offer is made in the soul. And B, the second point we have to uh, realize is implicit in the righteousness of God being revealed, is that this righteousness may be received according to the offer. So if Christ is believed by faith, the promise is made without wavering that he, might, he may be freely received. It would be a trick of the highest order to reveal then this pure clean water to the to the drenched or, or excuse me, not drenched the uh, the thirsty man, and then pull it away and say, "Oh, this is good clean water to drink, but it's not for you." So implicit in the offer is that when we see our need and when we see the remedy, that the remedy is for us. You see. That remedy is for us. These two implications of the righteousness of God being revealed to us next uh, <clears throat> implies that there is something in some men which enables them, according to his degree uh, or his faith, to believe that these things are true and to act according to that revelation. If we, if we admit on what has gone before, if we admit that the righteousness of God being real, revealed has implicit in it that it is an offer and that the offer is for you. Once we admit those two things, then once these things are revealed to us, then it is according to our faith that we are allowed to believe that this is true and that we can act according to that revelation. Okay. So you have two men in the desert, and they're both equally thirsty. And the uh, solution is revealed to them. To the one, this revelation implies that this is a solution and implies that it's for me, and that allows to him to act. The nature that has been imputed to him, that faith, allows him to move towards the solution. The other man sees that there is clear water, but has doubts that it's pure, has doubts that it's for him, or has doubts that, that, that it is what, it, what, it, what someone says that it is. And all of these doubts stop him from moving forward. Now this is not a perfect analogy. Because a really thirsty person is going to go drink the water. But, I hope that it shows you the point that we're making. <laughs> there is a, an error, of course, in uh, Arminianism. And that Arminianism puts a lake out there and just tells everybody, re regardless of your, of, of your uh, uh, the, the uh, imputation of any faith, that this is all for you. Right? But, and there's an error in hyper-Calvinism or antinomianism that basically asserts that you could sit down and not go drink the water and you're still going to be fine. The fact that it was offered and the fact that you were smart enough to figure that out or that you were, that was revealed to you as a child means that you don't have to do anything. That you can just sit. What we're saying is that... The faith of God, which is imputed into us, that allows us to see the solution, that allows us to see the offer and that the offer is for us, also equally motivates us to move forward and to take it and to receive it. Therefore, this is not a work. 
The Arminian solution is that there's this lake of water and it's over yonder, five clicks, and if you make it uh, and you work hard enough, you, 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 there's water there. Okay? It, it, it basically gives God none of that credit and it, it relies on human works. The, the antinomian solution is just to declare that you've received it. Just declare it. And once you declare it, then you're fine. The true gospel says that once that this, this solution has been shown to me, shown that it's mine, and shown that it is uh, what, it, uh, what it, the Lord says that it is, the Lord also motivates me to move forward and to take it, to receive it. Okay. So there is something in the two parties that I mentioned. There is something in the one that draws them forward to the solution that they partake of it and that hinders the other. Because if, if we carry the analogy over into human terms, you and your neighbor, or you and your sister, or you and your father, or you and your daughter, or you and your son, whoever it is that you know that has not received the true gospel, they saw, they were in the same condition. These two were in the same condition. They both saw or heard the solution to their problems. And one went forward and took it, and the other didn't. And this is the question I always have for Arminians. Is what causes me to differ from my atheist neighbor? I'm not smarter. I'm not wiser. There's something that has caused me to differ, to see the offer differently, to respond to it differently. And that something is faith. That's the best way that I know how to describe it. And uh, Christianity has, in the last hundred years has done a horrible job to, uh, in explaining what faith is. But faith is this gift that God gives from His own righteousness that draws those who are His to Himself so that they might receive those things that He has particularly for them. Alright? This something is the gift of faith. If a man is hungry and unable to provide food for himself or his family, and a messenger arrives that declares that a certain shop owner is willing to provide whatever food and provisions are necessary to stay, save the starving man and his family, in order for that offer to be realized, these things must happen. The starving man must realize that he is in need and will perish without aid. He must believe that there is such a shop owner and that the offer he has made is valid and is the true expression of the shop owner's will. And three, he must accept that that offer includes him. If any of those things fall short, the man will not proceed to the solution. Okay? If the starving man believes that these things are true, all of these things, then he has assented in his mind to the basic truths that are set forth, but that's only half of the issue. That's where modern Christianity stops. Modern Christianity teaches that mental assent is faith, is belief, and is salvation. But now he must determine if he will act upon that information and go receive that which is freely offered. Here is where the will must act. And so we have never denied that man has a will. And we have never denied that the will is in use in this process. The will must act here. And upon doing so, the will proves that the mind, which is the heart, has believed the message to be true. Okay? This is an act of faith. Now, here's where it could get very, very confusing because... So many of these terms are twisted or, or, or pictured inappropriately or wrongly. When the will is, in, is enabled or is enacted, when, when this man hears, okay, there's uh, my family's starving, we're all going to die. There's this shopkeeper, and he has offered free food to all those who will come and get it. I believe that this offer is true. I believe there is such a shopkeeper. I, I b believe the instructions that have been given to me about how to get there. 
And I believe that it's a true expression of his will. That and he and he has all the provision that's necessary to fulfill that which he's promised. And now my will says, now that I've assented to these things, I'm going to begin this journey. I'm going to move to, uh, forward in this journey. And the will is enacted here. Now the question is, is that will free? It cannot be. Because the act, the will is only, and you've heard me say this a thousand times, the will is only the expression of the decision that has already been made in the heart. Or the proclivities or the nature of of that heart. If you are already hardened to the point that you believe there is no solution, that there is no such shopkeeper, that there is a shopkeeper, but he doesn't have enough stuff, that the shopkeeper didn't make the offer, it's all a fraud, or you know any of those things, then the will is going to reflect that hardness in the heart and is going to reject moving forward. All right? And any number of hindrances can be placed between here and there that I'm going to discuss. Perhaps you go to such and such a town, you go to such and such a street, you see the street sign, you, you say that's the solution, and you sit down and die of starvation. This happens so often. You also can't go to the wrong shopkeeper. To show up at another shopkeeper's place and say, hey, I heard that you had food that would, that would save my family. Any number of things can happen. He can reject you. He can turn you away. He can give you poisonous food. He can tell you he is that shopkeeper and give you poison to go back and kill your family with. And this is what the false gospel is. So any number of things have to happen from here to there that uh, complete this transaction. In every one of those steps, the faith of God and the light of God guides us and pulls us forward if we are His. But many, many begin on that trip and never conclude. Never conclude. Some actually hear the message that there is such a shopkeeper and they go, Yay, I'm saved. And they go to bed. Imagine the folly of that. All right. I've used these analogies of the hungry man seeking food and the thirsty man seeking water, but these analogies fail because um, generally any hungry man who's offered food or any thirsty man who's offered water is going to go. Because the carnal man is already has the proclivity or the the tendency to want food and water the difference here is that the carnal man has no tendency and no proclivity to want christ or salvation here's where we have to bring in the scriptures and we have to bring in all that the bible has to say about the nature of man and we have to say okay those are good analogies that show us something but they don't show us the real issue they really don't show us how bad our condition is because if we were to go back and revisit those analogies, we would have to say, not only was the thirsty man in the desert about to die of dehydration, but he had a positive hatred of water. He was predisposed to want to die without water. He was not only, not only that, but he was at war with the water bringer. That's your real condition. Now you have to consider what, what is it that drives a man to seek this remedy when these are his conditions. The, the hungry man with his family. He loves starvation. He loves death. He hates the storekeeper. He hates the concept that there might even be a storekeeper with such an offer. He is a, a mocker. He is angry. Let's make it even worse than that. Both of the people and both of the analogies are already dead. That's your real condition. When the righteousness of Christ is revealed to you. You're dead. There is no remnant of moral ability in man 
no. left over from the fall that causes him to desire Christ or salvation. No, These no. children of whatever age, they desire Christianity or they desire church because their parents do. They desire salvation because it's better than hell. You see? But what has to happen is that they have to come to the understanding by faith of their own condition and their own needs so that they go themselves to the fountain. You see? We can help them. Because the person who delivered the message about the, the shopkeeper is an evangelist. You see? And the evangelist, evangelist uh, reasserts their condition. He doesn't make them comfortable in it. If you were the one that was sent to this family that was starving to death, and you know they already had a proclivity to die of starvation, they already had a hatred of the shopkeeper, they had all of the, these negative characteristics, would it be in their best interest for you to go in there and go, you're okay. You're okay. You're going to be fine. You know, the shopkeeper loves you. It's not in their best interest. Neither, neither is it in the best interest of our children for us to convince them that they're saved just because they're in our family or because we want them to. It's not in the best interest of our parents, our neighbors, our children, anybody else to make them comfortable in their starvation and in their thirst. You see? Evangelism includes all of this, uh, these methods, including passing by that house so that he can see you continuing to go for sustenance. Continuing to go for sustenance and being fulfilled. Right? Therefore we acknowledge that for a man to see his true condition and to believe that God has made the offer of salvation to him and to apprehend and accept this offer as true and to move by faith to take and receive the salvation offered is the work of God. For this is the work of God that ye believe on him whom uh, the uh, whom he excuse me him whom he hath sent. John 6:29. For this is the work of God that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. John 6:29. So I'll uh, reassert it here because it's here. Now in order for the man in our allegory to receive the promised food there are three things necessary. First, that he know and seek the right shop owner. It does no good for him to seek the free gift from another. He must not make an error in person. Okay? No error in person. Anybody have any idea what this refers to? Different Christ. Another Christ. The Christ being offered must be the Christ of the Scriptures. There is only one universal revelation of Jesus Christ available to us that defines who Christ is. And that's God's Word. Okay? And that must be the Christ in every one of those characteristics. Now when we study Owen... And we say, look into Christ, look into Christ, look into Christ, look into Christ. Why is that? So that you don't make an error in person. Not only is there the positive benefits of as you look into Christ, you are being conformed into His image day by day. That you are humbled. That you receive gifts of grace. But there is the uh, added grace of being able to see Him and know Him and love Him and not make an error in person. Because I can tell you that the Christ offered by the world and the religious world and modern Christianity is more attractive to the carnal man than the Christ of the Bible. Because what does the Scripture say about Christ? There was no comeliness in Him that anyone would desire Him. Is that true? 
That means the natural man has no attraction for the real Christ of the Scripture. This is not speaking of his physical uh, attractiveness. And if it is, it's not a, that alone. It's saying that the, the carnal man is not going to be attracted to a Christ who referred to Gentiles as dogs or to a Christ who stated plainly that he spoke in code so that most of the people who hear him would never turn to him. They're not going to be attracted to a Christ who sits in judgment, who comes with a sword with blood up to his thigh, executing vengeance, at the same time claiming that he has hidden the solution from most all of man, which is the next chapter. The righteousness of God hidden. So the, the carnal man is not going to be attracted to this Christ. So I can tell you, if you're watching TV or if you're going to some church or if you've got some preacher and the Christ that he's preaching is attracted to the carnal man, you've got a wrong Christ. You've made an error in person. You've gone to the wrong shopkeeper. The Christ of our family members, the Christ of, of uh, all of these denominations who just loves everybody the long-haired, hippie, blue-eyed Jesus who just died, died, opened his arms and died just so that everybody, everybody, come on. That's not the Christ of the Scriptures. All right. So you can make, uh, you need to make no error in person. All right, what's the second one? He must know what it is to receive the gift and to finish the transaction. If he stops at the gate of the city and proceeds not to the right shop, or if he believes himself to have received the gift merely based on the promise without taking the gift, then he plainly has not received the gift. So, must complete the transaction. Which means antinomianism is overruled or thrown out. Uh, which is, includes hyper-Calvinism or most uh, versions of hyper-Calvinism that are lawless. Arminianism is ruled out. But this, uh, this transaction must be completed by faith. Which is to say, if Christ came and, he, and there was a huge mountain and he said, those who I love, those who I save, I'm going to give them the power to climb over that mountain. And when we get to the other side, those that are there, those are the saved. How foolish would it be for any church to sit there and teach, oh, Christ came and he saved us, and they stay on this side of the mountain. Or to begin to climb and find it's too hard and turn back. Or to get all the way to the peak and to look onto the other side and say there's giants in the land and turn back. You see? This is not works. Christ has said those who have received his imputed righteousness, the righteousness of God, will do these things. And one of those things is they will come, uh, they will come forth and receive that righteousness. It's received by faith from that Christ, the real Christ. Okay. Okay, number three, or third. His will must be won to the point that he is compelled to complete the journey. In saying that we must receive the righteousness of Christ, we admit that we must receive both Christ and his righteousness. There is no receiving of his righteousness without our also receiving Christ. And so Christ must be received first. This is to say that, in shorthand for this, 
is that when we say that the righteousness of Christ must re be received, the righteousness of Christ is in Christ. And therefore, Christ must be received. Okay? And this is to say that if Christ is received, there's going to be fruit or evidence. Alright? This shows that the will was enacted by faith to complete the transaction and that Christ has received. So the evidence is there. In our, in our analogy, when our hungry man shows up, he receives the food and he eats of it and he's, uh, he's uh, revived. And we see him and he's no longer starving. This is evidence that he has received the gift. Okay. Now, this is why it is so critical that the Christ we say we have believed be the Christ of the Bible and not some false Christ created by the devil through treachery. Just as the Christ of this generation bears no likeness or similitude to the Christ of, of the Bible, so there have been Christ in every age who have deceived many unto their own destruction. So if any man is deceived by a false Christ, of which there are many, or by a false gospel, which predominate today, or if he begins the pilgrim journey but do, does not go unto Christ, or if he does not take Christ as he must, then he makes evident that his faith was human and earthly, and not that spiritual faith authored and finished by Christ. He has not received Christ. Only those who have the faith of Christ, who is its author and finisher, can be assured that they will take him as he has promised and be saved. Okay, so this is to say, if we look out upon a group of people or upon an individual, and we see their fruit, right? And we see the fruit of... Joel Osteen, or we see the fruit of Benny Hinn, or we see the uh, fruit of the Seventh-day Adventist Church Adventist Church in Santa Ana, or whatever it is. And that fruit is not real. Or is false fruit. Then we can say that they have not received Christ. Alright? This is not saying that they won't. Sometime in the future, we could say that they have not received Christ, or they have not received Christ to right. This is critical to our understanding. Because there's a reason that the elect of God are said to be separate. And that separation is necessary to the proper identification of fruit. So that the fruit can be seen. So that the light is not put under a bushel, but is, is put up on a, on a candlestick. Right? Right? The fruit has to be evident for us to say. This is this serves a twofold purpose. It allows us to evaluate fairly and according to the scripture those with whom we have to do. Those with whom we have business. Those with whom we have fellowship. Those with whom we have uh, contact. So that we guide our behavior properly towards the outside world. Also, it allows us to examine ourselves. Because if we continuously look into the Scriptures and we identify the fruit and we don't see that fruit in us, then it ought to give us pause and draw us back to the fountain. To draw us back to the shopkeeper. To draw us back to the physician. So your job is twofold. As a member, professing member of the true church of Jesus Christ, the true body of Christ, you have the obligation to examine the fruit of all those with whom you have contact or any type of uh, affection or uh, intercourse and to guide your behavior appro uh, appropriately. Secondarily, you are to use that, that same standard to examine yourself. The difference is 
hopefully, if upon examining yourself honestly, you find that you fall short, it is not up to you to fix it, but it is up to you to go to where it can be fixed. And that is to the fountain. To go to Christ. Re-identify Christ. Look into Christ more. Examine Him more fully. Now, because of our nature, even when we're regenerated, most of us being uh, blinded uh, often by our own sin, we are often not able to examine ourselves fairly. Okay? You must examine yourself, but you must examine yourself fairly. And so there are some who err on the side of giving themselves a pass and saying they're okay no matter what. And therefore they starve or they continue to be uh, shorted in the graces of God that could be theirs. Because they're not driven back to the fountain. They're driven back to the source. They, they cease to look at Christ. And there are others who judge themselves too harshly. Who are judged themselves by a standard that is not accurate or biblical. Who expect perfection on this in this world, and rather than just continuously seeking repentance, they uh, fall into um, depression or uh, doubt. Okay. Neither one of those two things does what the gospel was designed to do, which is to cause you to return to the fountain. The gospel is designed to cause you to return to the source of all graces and all mercy. It was not designed to cause you to give up, and it was not designed to cause you to feel satisfied. We have peace and patience and those things that are given to us by grace, and yet, the gospel is designed to constantly be a mirror that held up, allows us to see ourselves as we are, and to remember that when we walk away from the mirror, so that we constantly seek Christ. I say this and repeat it so much, because this is where we can identify the failure of heterodox gospels, or false gospels. Christ's faith given necessarily delivers the elect to the real Christ. Thus it is revealed from faith to faith. Christ's faith delivered necessarily delivers the one, the elect, to the real Christ. Okay? If you were delivered to, the, to a false Christ, then you had a false faith. Which Christ is the essential question. Okay, so the Christ who offers salvation is holy. And he is one who will not share his glory with another master. He will only be served by those who have put off the world as master. He is a jealous husband who will, not, who will have a bride that loves him above all things. Who serves no idols. He is hated by the world and therefore brings persecution on those who come to him by faith and thus they will be hated as well. And this according to his own promise. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. John 15, 19. This gives us a further way to identify those who are truly uh, the children of Christ and those who are not. If they assert in their gospel or if they assert in their behavior or they assert through their fruit that it is okay to continue with your former loves, your former idolatries, whatever those things are, and that God has saved us despite those things, or to uh, to Christify those things and put bumper stickers on them and call them Christian now. If He hasn't delivered us from those loves and delivered us to Him instead, then we can see that we have a false Christ. Because the Bible says plainly that God is a jealous God. He will not share his bride with idols. And Israel is, a plain, is plain evidence of that. The second thing is, is if what they are saying is not despised by the world, then it is not the true gospel, and they have not received Christ aright. 
The Christ that they've received is not the Christ of the Bible because the Christ of the Bible says, if you love me, the world will hate you. Persecution comes with him. And it can come in different amounts, in different times, based on God's periods of light and darkness. But persecution is inevitable from family, from friends, from children, from neighbors, from brethren. It's inevitable if we stand firm in these truths that the world will hate us. To take Christ as husband is to be divorced from all other lovers and have him as king as well as high priest and prophet. Too many will say they have come to Christ, yet they love the world, are married to other lovers, and though they will declare Christ as Savior, they will not have Christ as King or Lord. They do not know that they have missed the person and have erred by approaching another Christ altogether. We must go to the real Christ and not the Christ created by millionaire evangelists and carnal theologians. We must go to the real Christ that was killed by the world and not the Christ who the world loves and follows. Too many will say that they know and have taken Christ when by every biblical measure they have refused Him as King and Lord. These are those to whom He will profess, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Matthew 7.23 It's not enough that we understand the Gospel with our mind so that we assent to its essential truths and agree that they are true. The Bible says we must receive Him which is an act of the regenerated will. He came into his own, but his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. John 1, 11-12. Listen closely. The power to become the sons of God is given to them that believe. You understand? The power to be made evident as the sons of God is given unto them that believe. When we receive His righteousness, we are given the power to be made evident as the sons of God, which means things like sanctification and conversion begin and are carried out by Christ, who is the author and finisher of that faith. To say then, as the church does, the modern church, that they have received Christ, is th that is the same assertion that the Jews made when Christ said, He came unto them and they received Him not. And I assure you that Christ is going to say to the church of this world, to this modern church, get away from me. I never knew you. You see, the whole time they were enamored with the false Christ. The Christ of free will theism. The, the Christ of antinomianism. The, the Christ of worldliness. Of syncretism. Of being committed unto evangelism while not ever identifying the true gospel or the true Christ that's being evangelized. Those who do not seek Christ or right, who seek another person they call Christ, and who do not receive Him by faith, and do, who do not enter into marriage uh, to Him, taking on His name, which includes the hatred and scorn of this world, and who do not receive and obey Him as King and Lord, are not His. So any number of these things can be true, and yet you do not take Christ as King and Lord. What is it to have a master? in the biblical sense. A master or a king is master or king without question. Not according to our opinion, not according to our emotion, not according to our manipulations and our rebellions, but he is a king without question. Which means if he says that tomorrow you are to wear polka dots and stand out on the street corner, then that's what you're to do. Without question, 
without regard to consequences. He hasn't said that, so don't do that. But that is to say that because his commands seem onerous in a world that has slipped away from him and that has, has drifted so far off the end of the earth, uh, to say that somehow his standards have changed is to identify another Christ. And it's a false Christianity. The true Christ of the Bible must be taken as King and Lord. Which means he is an absolute master of his house. What he says is law, no matter how absurd we think it is, or unfair we think it is, or unfair the world thinks it is, no matter what it is, what he says is law, and that is done absolutely without regard to consequence. When we halt between two opinions, when we continue to uh, operate by the flesh and instead of by faith, when we argue, when we quibble with God, we are showing that we have not taken Him as husband. Because we still have idols. We still have former lovers. So it's now going to be objected that, and this is, uh, there's a derogatory term called Lordship Salvation and all this. Uh, antinomians learn this the first week of antinomian school. Is that if anybody says you must take Christ as Lord, that's Lordship Salvation, that's works, and that is not, not the Gospel. We have been very careful to identify that these things, the receiving of Him, the drawing to Him, the coming unto Him according to His mandates, <coughs> the keeping of His commandments, the taking of Him as Lord and His Master, as King, as Prophet, as Priest, that these things are acts of faith motivated by Him and worked out through Him, through us, by Him. It is impossible for them to prove in any true and serious, logical, reasonable, reasonable or biblical way that this is works-based salvation. Because what we are saying is we are identifying what salvation is. Okay? We are identifying who has identified a wrong Christ or who has taken a wrong Christ or who hasn't received uh, his righteousness. We're, we are identifying and we are identifying who has. It is not works to have uh, to be animated from the death. From, from death. The coming forth of Lazarus from the tomb was not works, but come forth he did at the command of his master. That is not works. Could not be further from the truth that this is works-based salvation, though those of the antinomian belief will deem it so. What we have described here are the attributes of those who believe and receive Christ. None of these were qualifications or requirements for salvation. But identify who it is that freely goes unto Christ for salvation. Those who feel no need, though the gospel is offered to them, will not receive it. Those who are deceived as to the identity of Christ, as to the offer he has made, will gladly receive a false Christ and a false offer. But when apprised of the identity and the character of the true Christ, they will not uh, believe or receive him. By this I say, there are those that you are related to, your friends, neighbors, people that you know out there in the world, and they will say that they are Christians, they will assert that they are Christians, even though their behavior belies that, their behavior uh, shows that that's not true. And if you say, uh, I believe that you've received a false Christ and I believe I can prove it, because Christ says this about himself. And you read what I just read, they'll say, I'll have nothing to do with that Christ. You see? They'll say they've received Christ, but when Christ is identified, they won't want anything to do with it. So a man or a woman may gladly embrace the modernist gospel and believe themselves to be full of faith and saved, yet if we present to them that those whom Christ marries are lowly and humbled, persecuted and afflicted, hated and scorned, the offscouring of the earth, and that they do not look like the world, and that they who marry him must obey him and his commandments, uh, and must have him as complete Lord as well as Savior, then these who have made a profession of faith by a false gospel to a false Christ 
will reject and not receive the true gospel and the true Christ. This will be made evident at the judgment seat when they stand and believe themselves to be saved having gone through a whole life. Billy Graham, Pope John Paul II, uh, any of those people. And they stand before a holy God and it's not the Christ that they identified in life. It is no work of man that saves them who come to Christ, but we are identifying the attributes of those who have truly come to the true Christ. All right, any questions? Do you, uh, do you want to elaborate any more about the, uh, what was it, the antino antinomian um, idea of the lordship, right. salvation? Okay. I don't well, think I've ever heard that yeah. before. Do, a, do a, a web search on it, and there's all kinds of pages that uh, uh, pretend to refute lordship salvation. And they do so, the trick is in the name, because we don't believe in lordship salvation. We believe in salvation lordship. We believe if you're saved, you will take Christ as Lord, as well as Savior. Okay, so the antinomians believe that to say that these fruit will be evidenced by believers is uh, is works because in their minds they believe you're saying that they have to do these things and we're not saying that we're saying you would do those things which is is not a slight difference the antinomians will also say okay I received Christ as Savior and the word Savior means something to them if you go to an antinomian uh, anywhere uh, even Bob George. And we, we say to him, uh, you've, you've taken Christ as Savior. He would say, yes. What does the word Savior mean? He would say, the one who saved me. Right? But if I went to the same person and I said, have you taken him as Lord? He would say, oh yeah, he's, he's the Lord who saved me. The Lord is a proper noun. But what, is it, what does the word Lord mean in the Scripture? Master. King. Right? If I've taken him as master, I've taken him as king, those words mean things. It's not just a name that goes before Christ. Okay? So what then he will argue, okay, well you're saying I have to do that, so that's works based salvation. And we're saying no. We're saying no. If you are saved, you will do that. So it, it's it's not a uh Sophistical difference. It's it's a it's it's a valid, complete, different view. So they can only win that argument in their on their websites and their web pages by misstating the position of true Christianity. Right. Some of them even give lip service to the idea that yes, they'll argue against it. Then they'll say yes, if you are saved, you will take Christ as Lord. But that doesn't mean that your life will change, or you know, they'll, they'll, then they'll soften it by saying, "Oh, that you know, that they'll turn it into uh, just words, just words." There is no concrete view as to what it means, because if you went to them and you said, "Okay, so we have to keep the commandments," they're going to make those commandments as uh, uh, soft and undefinable as possible. All right. Any other questions? All right. Lord willing, we'll uh, go to point five uh, next time, and that'll be through the end of the chapter. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.